Here we are, back to Bridie of the Grand Canyon. We're at the next two chapters. Over the Rim Top. There's no picture here. Over the Rim Top. Was there a wildness in Bridie that could never be tamed? A need for freedom stronger than the need for companionship? Daytimes. Daytimes, the canyon was all he wanted. Winds rumpling his mane, birds whistling at him, and bright Angel Creek talking and laughing. But sometimes at night, a loneliness crept into him, and he would bray to the twinkling stars as if asking them to come down and play with him. All winter long, the world of the canyon was Bridie's world. Here in the inner reaches of the the weather was fine and the mesquite beans plentiful and he roamed about snug and warm. Up on the rim, however, the snow fell endlessly. If half buried, it half buried the trees and then drifted partway down the wall, laying a thick fleece on the rocks. The snow line made a regular marker for him, a white fence that kept him within the canyon eight months of the year. But this year, with old timer gone, the canyon was not the snug hidey hole it used to be. It seemed a dark, broody place, a wilderness of tumbled, jumbled rock. The wind cried and the creek blatted mon uh, monotonously. Even the birds seemed depressed and kept their twitters low. Often, Bridie wandered back to old timer's camp. Once there, he drew into the willows. He was like a man in ambush, seeing but unseen. Day after day, he watched the man, Jake Irons, climb the tree ladder and disappear in the black mine like a mole into his ruin. And once he watched him climb down with a load on his back and swing across a river in the wooden cage. Then for a long time, he, would, he could make out the figure crawling up the wall on the other side until it blended with the limestone was lost. As days came and went, a restlessness grew in Bridie and urged to leave the lonely canyon. Now the sun was striking down a little earlier each day and staying a little longer. Its warm rays revived him and stirred him to the remembrance of the North Rim up there. Up there, a little alpine meadow lay cupped in the kebab forest and nearby was his secret cave with its pool of delicious spring-fed water. Each day, the stirring within him sharpened. His eyes kept gazing up at the rim as if mere looking would melt the snow and hurry the spring. And then, all at once, it came. Warm rains washed down the face of the north wall, and when Bridie glanced up one early morning, May morning, the white fence was gone. Now he was like a man squaring his shoulders for a big job, a job he liked doing. His loafing days were over. He had some place to go, his summer home. Big as the sky was waiting for him up there beyond the canyon rim, and Uncle Jim would be waiting too. He started climbing the miles as if it were as if there were no time to lose. He plunged into the rushing waters of Bright Angel Creek, almost strutting over the boulders. A willow branch whisked across his ears, bending them backwards. Other days he would have been, have taken from would have taken time for a second rub and a third, but today he hurried on. Crisscrossing the creek was the trail he had made. He sniffed his way along, nostrils quivering in excitement. He caught the fresh scent of deer tracks, but it did not tease him off on little, on little detours. Today, first things were first. Climbing was the thing. He paid no attention to a canyon wren scolding him or to butterflies doing figure eights over his head. Resolutely, he wound and twisted his way up, up, and up the prickly pear and the hedgehog cactus reached out with prickles and hooks, but nimble, he sidestepped them. Today, nothing must stop him. By noon, he reached Ribbon Falls, a white jet of water that shot gaily out of the rocks above, washed down the face of a jutting ledge, and then joined forces with the creek. My Bridie could never resist the pretty beckoning finger of Ribbon Falls. In spite of his hurry, he took a little cut-off trail that went behind the cascade. Memory led him to the place where the water divided around a boulder. It made a peephole just big enough for his head, ears and all. Shivering with pleasure, he poked his nose through, letting the spray tickle his ears. Memory, too, told him not to waggle them, for one flick to right or left and the force of the water would flatten them to the roots. He stood there a while, showing his teeth in a burrow grin, enjoying the peephole as if it had not 
as if it had been put made to size, especially for him. Then back to the climb, and now the wall rising sharper, and the trail spinning finer, and the little gray figure moving on, ears flopping, eyes unimpressed by the vermilion pillars on one side and the black abyss on the other. Climb a hundred paces, rest and blow, climb, blow, climb, blow, try running in little dashes up toward a new voice, the distant voice of roaring springs. Listen to the growl, hear the hiss and howl, then, deafened by the roar, see the shoots of water come spurting down the craggy rocks. Blue shadows of afternoon, and now the hardest climb of all, the devil's, devil's backyard. Rocks, rocks, everywhere, as if some giant devil had ground his teeth and spit and spewed them in every direction. Smooth rocks, jagged rocks, they scraped Bridie's shoulder, they blocked his feet, they made hurdles to trip and hinder him, but not even the rocks could stay him. He squared off, charged pell-mell up the boulder-strewn steps until the devil's backyard was behind. <laughs> he paused a moment, breathing heavily. At last, the stiff climb was over. Ahead, dark green evergreens and white-trunked aspen grew on either side of the trail. He was almost there, almost to the top of the world. A buck deer stood in his path, then made a whistling noise as he turned tail. With a joyous snort of his own, Bridie broke into a gallop and took out after him, crashing through the tangle of grapevine and scrub oak. Blue Jay screamed at him. Squirrels scolded and scattered. And then, and then, he was over the top and on the rim top of the world. Gone were the cliff walls and the rock temples. He was Here was four so dense it swallowed up the deer. Bridie ran soundlessly on the forest duff, weaving in and out among the pines and aspens, and just at sunset he came upon his little cup of meadow nestled deep in the woods. It lay in a pool of shadow with only slivers of gold where the sun pushed through the trees and it smelled of the sweetness of lupine and wet earth and new grass. With tired feet, Bridie tested the welcoming green carpet. His, his hoofs sunk deep. He doubled his legs like a, knife, a jackknife and fell into its softness. A great peace came over him. For a long time, he lay still, as if bedding down for the night. Then, wanting to feel more of it, he began rolling blissfully this way and that, enjoying the springiness of the grass after his rocky canyon bed. At last, he rose to crop, to crop the juicy blades. A doe her, and her spotted twins came to share his retreat, but they gazed wet-nosed at him from a little distance. The sun dipped low and purpled the sh shadows across the meadow. Bridie heaved a sigh. The meadow was just where it should be. He had rolled in it. He had eaten his fill of it now to find his secret cave and to give himself to sleep. Now comes the fight in the cave. An eerie moon danced its beams along the thread-like path from Bridie's meadow to his cave. He stopped a moment to listen to the stillness of the night, but he found that it was st not still at all. A bat whirled around him, squeaking, and an owl whispered, hoo, hoo, hoo. With a grunt of happiness, Bridie loped along the path until it opened to a black cavern, where night had built a vast shelter with an overhanging floor for a roof. A wide, went, uh, sand-swept floor and one side open to the canyon. But what endeared it to Bridie was the pool of clean, clear water near the back wall and the bed of ferns, the lion. Tonight, the moon quicksilvered the pool, and as the droplets fell from the cracks of the ceiling, they made the water wrinkle in an ever-widening circle. Bridie's keen eyes looked around his lair and his ears pricked to catch the small, dulcet no, no, notes of the water. They had not changed their tune. Blink, flash, blink, flash, blink. He buried his, nuzzle, his muzzle and drank deep. Then he settled down in a clump of fern like a tired child, come home at last to his own bed. His mouth opened in a great stretching yawn. Everything was just as before, even the ghost white tree trunk guarding the open side of the cave. As he lay among the ferns watching the sailing moon, there was a sudden uprush, uprush of wings and a great flock of doves swept into his grotto. The noise was deafening, but in spite of it, Bridie's eyelids drooped as he let the doves share his pool and scratch in the sand, eating the grains. They left as noisily as they had come, and no sooner were they gone than a mule deer stole silently to the pool to drink, but Bridie had already fallen asleep, his little snorings blending with the wind song and the water tinkling into the pool.
night wore on. The wind died. There was only a drip, drip of the water and a fern stem teetering back and forth to Bridie's breathing. Then, from far below the lip of a cave, of the cave, a mountain lion came slinking upward, her tawny coat mixing with the lights and the shadows of the rocks. Her cat eyes gleamed golden green in the dark as she crept nearer and nearer the old dead tree. She halted there a moment, then hooked her claws into the trunk and climbed swiftly until she was even with the cave. At first, Bridie lay undiscovered in the darkness, but the lion's eyes prowled the shadows and suddenly fixed upon his white belly. For a long time, she seemed bewitched by her prey and lay watching him, her tail lashing her mouth, partly open, showing the white fangs. At last, she stole soundlessly forward on a limb, tested it with a four, her forepaws, then with her whole body it bent to her weight, and she steadied herself, balancing like a diver. Then with one powerful leap, she, her body made an arc in the blackness, just like that. At the very moment of her leap, Bridie was snuggling deeper into the ferns, and she landed short of her mark cruel claws intended for his head and neck, ripped his forelegs from shoulder to hoof. Instantly he was sharp awake, a fire pain shooting up his legs. He leaped to his feet, squealing in terror as he faced the howling, hissing lion. He pawed wildly, kicking at her eyeball fire, her fireball eyes, trying to push her over the brink, but cunningly she rolled underneath him, cuffing and stabbing the, with rapier claws, Bridie backed away, rearing, then came down, flailing with his hooves. Once he landed on the soft muscle body, but she slithered out from under him. He could feel blood oozing out a hot down his forelegs, but he felt no weakness, only a frenzied frenzy deep need to stamp out the yellow flame of her eyes to stop the hissing sound. Suddenly, the lion turned and with a bound was up in the tree. She tried a second spring for the, for the catch, and this time she landed on Bridie's back. Down they went. Both went onto the floor of the cave, a snarling, grunting shadow in the moonlight. One moment they were almost in the pool, and next on the rim of the abyss with nothing but darkness and space below. The stars swam around Bridie, and mixed with the moon, and his blood trickled darkly in the sand. He tried to make to shake free of the claws, stabbing his shoulder, but they only dug deeper now. The two figures grappled and came again to the pool, and they were spinning into the icy water. Still, the lion would not let go. With a scream of pain, Bridie rolled over on his back, pinning her beneath, his, beneath him in the water. For a long minute, he held her there. Then gradually, the little claws ceased, and at last, they fell away. Bridie drowned the mountain lion. Wow, what a fight. Well, there you go. Back with more later. Bye.